Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Denise Pearl, and I am a global ISV lead at Google Cloud, looking after some of our key partners focused on geospatial earth observation and sustainability. And we're here today for a great discussion around the rapidly growing role of geospatial analysis to ensure sustainability uh, moving forward. So I'm going to quickly introduce the panelists just by name and title. I encourage all of you to go take a look at their profiles on LinkedIn and some of the work that they're doing. Um, I know Andrew in particular has a really robust website on his own, give you a bit more detail about their uh, backgrounds and what they're working on today. But joining me is Andrew Zolli, who is Vice President of Global Impact Initiatives at Planet. Greg Verutz, who's Data Science and GIS Lead at Marfish Eco, and also a PhD student at the University of, I'm going to say this terribly, Greg, why don't you just say it for me? University of Santiago de Compostela. See, it's so much better coming from you. And of course, Jamie Herring, who is the CEO of Climate Engine, Asina Kashuk, who's Senior Vice President and Head of Unfolded, and also working on some pretty amazing geospatial work at Foursquare. And then of course, Rosalie, who is a co-founder and CEO at Ellipsis Drive. So you guys, I'm just gonna dig in very quickly. And uh, Andrew, I know we, we talked about why are we all here today talking about sustainability? I feel like sustainability is really having a quote unquote moment. And I'm just curious about your thoughts about why, like why now, what's happening? And, and if you could share with me, like what is Planet's role in all of that? That would be great. Sure. Well, <clears throat> maybe first of all, wonderful to see all of you uh, in person and, and those of you who are listening and Denise, thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, let's start with what's happening on the planet. So human beings have now terraform 75% of the land mass of the earth. We use a third of the world's lands for agriculture. We've transformed two thirds of the biotic environments of the oceans. We've, <clears throat> um, we've uh, imperiled more than a million species according to the UN, uh, which are an imminent risk of distinction uh, by the middle of the century. And of course we've created, we're, we're in the moment, literally the reason that you say that sustainability and climate and biodiversity are, are having a moment is because we are living in the most important year in the most important decade of our collective lives when it comes to the to the climate so you know the the uh, ipcc the intergovernmental panel on climate change released recently released a port, uh, report ahead of the big climate summit coming up next week in glasgow and they identified five future likely scenarios for the earth in only one of those do we actually avoid the worst effects of climate change. And that scenario requires us to engage in earnest action right now. So we have just at the most basic level, we have these twin profound crises. One is a crisis of the climate and one is a crisis of nature, the loss of nature. And these are critical, not just existential risks to human beings, but they are also moral risks. You know, the, this is this is a, about the life, the the world that we leave behind. And so, in order to act on those, there's really two things we have to do. The first is we have to shift all kinds of behaviors. The Biden administration, for instance, for instance, recently said uh, set a goal for the United States where they would like to reduce our emissions to 50 percent below their 2005 rates by the end of the decade. That is a ridiculously ambitious objective. In order to do it, we're gonna to have to transform everything from the way we use the land, the way we generate energy, the way we transport ourselves, the way we use water, the way we engage in agriculture. And all of those behaviors need an observational capacity to tell us whether or not they're working. And that's where geospatial data in analytics and the kinds of things that this esteemed group of, of, of uh, fellow panelists are all working on. It's, it's to get us to a point where we can take continuous observation of the earth and extract from it the essential insights and indicators that tell us whether or not these key behaviors are, are working and whether or not whether we're making progress in one area or falling behind in another. And, and so this is really a kind of giant moral mirror. If you take, take the data, the analytics, the visualization capacity and the, and the tools that we 
where we extract those insights to drive action. And they really become the essence of a kind of planetary feedback loop that will be essential to get us through this transition. And the risks of us not doing so couldn't be more profound. So I, I think with lots and lots of things we could we could talk about as, as the panel goes on. I think folks on the on the call if, uh, you know, who are watching may know that Planet operates the largest constellation of Earth observing satellites and collectively images the whole Earth every day at a little more than three meters per pixel. And that kind of data set is a sort of foundational layer for many of these other activities. I really appreciate that, Andrew. Um, and for those of you watching, there is a comments section and we're going to take about 25 minutes to discuss the content today and then we'll leave a few minutes at the end to answer any questions. So if you want to post your questions over there, that would be great. We've got some wonderful leadership here to give you some answers. And yes, we're thrilled that the D Dominicana Republic Association, I hope I said that right, is here this morning. So Andrew, I love everything you just said. Um, I wanted to just kind of, maybe Sina, you can help me a little bit here. I feel like we have a lot of data. Andrew just mentioned that planet's taking a picture of the planet every day. I feel like this discussion about being at this precipice has been going on for quite some time and this need to change. So what is what is it? Why, why can't we get more action? Um, do you feel like it's a lack of people that have a background like yours in geospatial and in data analytics and bringing that together to get people engaged in this conversation? Like what's missing there from, from a people standpoint to get people more grounded in what Andrew just mentioned? Um, hi, yes, um, I feel like um, the field is growing. So uh, we're having more and more of people that are doing spatial data science. Uh, we have a conference now for spatial data science. So that's that's the evidence. And of course, the number of attendees are growing uh, since I think 2016 or 15, when Javier started the first um, the first um, conference. And um, so so it, I, I don't think it's much about, honestly, um, do we have enough talent uh, in the field to do the job or not? It's more of, do we have the right data to do the job? You do have a lot of data. Uh, do we have the right data? Do, is is um, is the accuracy there? Um, and if the answer is yes, then it goes to the next. Uh, does people do people uh, does that people have access to to the to the data or not? Um, and of course, Planet is doing a phenomenal job on a spatial temporal um, asset catalog to to help people to you know access the data easier, right? And then. Let's say if we have um, good data and we do have access to it, can we can we combine the data together? Uh, are we able to get a telemetry data and combine it with satellite imagery? Because there is a lot of things hap uh, happening between between the two, right? Um, it's not only enough to to just see what is happening in the ground, but also you want to see the activity that is happening in the ground, right? Would you be able to combine this together? And um, then after that is um is is the science behind that is ready or not my belief is like science has been ready since 50 years ago so i don't think that that is a challenge right and then um after that is now you get the data maybe you do your analysis are you able to communicate this right with your audience which, which the visualization comes comes to the place and then when you think about it uh, we're asking a person to do all of this job in one and and we, we give them different hats you're data scientist you're also data engineer you're also subject matter experts you have to understand what you're building and uh, you have to visualize that all of these are like you can get phds in a subset of these 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 uh, uh yeah. science I, I believe but so so uh, how how can we help right uh, my my belief is again and what what we decided to start actually unfolded was that can we build a platform that enables these people right and and there are a lot of platforms out there i mean earth engine is doing a phenomenal job carter is doing amazing right well, are, are, are we there yet, right? Are we able to uh, bring a person with not a massive knowledge in every of these um, these fields to come and start doing the analysis? Can we remove the jargon word? Can we remove the coordinate system? It's a, it's, a, it's a hard problem, right? Like you have to transform your data from one to another coordinate system every time you're having an image coming from different sources or even when you're trying to combine that with, with the other type of data. So. So I think those are the the challenges. That that's my again very very personal belief that if if you have better tooling, 
Uh, and of course, we need to verticalize them for a specific industry. In, in this case, we have sustainability. And even within that, we got to figure out what are the questions that we're trying to solve and then enabling this, this platform to, to, to solve those uh, for, um, for their, their users. So that's, that's my thought. I love that, Sina, and I appreciate the call out to Earth Engine. Uh, Planet and Google Cloud actually both had their big events about two weeks mm -hmm. ago, and you guys may have seen that we had a, a wonderful uh, group of announcements around sustainability, one of them around the, the partnership community that's supporting Earth Engine as it becomes more generally available uh, to corporations and government agencies uh, through partners like Planet and Cardo and Climate Engine. So. Jamie, maybe that takes me to you. I think one of the things that Cena said that really jumps out to me is you've got a lot of data. You've got some great people. They're starting to do the analytics against this data. How important is the science element, as Cena mentioned? Like the science he said is there. Um, and I think that that's true. But like, how do we make sure that the, the scientific rigor is being applied to these sustainability questions, making sure that like the insights you're giving are ones that we could actually use to inform policy? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Denise, and thanks, Andrew and, and Sina. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, I agree with Sina. I mean, the science is there. The science has been there. I think this is one of the rare sort of occasions where the science is ahead of the business, right, as opposed to the other way around. Um, you know, we, we know more about the planet than we ever have, right? And, and, and the data itself is not even necessarily the biggest challenge. I mean, the groups like Planet um, are doing a fantastic job of capturing the data, you know, there's all kinds of different sensors that are being launched all the time. Um, we have more raw data about the planet than any other point in history. The, the, the real challenge is converting that into an insight that someone can take an action on. And I think that's where the scientific aspect um, of, of the work really needs to take place and, and, and has to take place. So, you know, our view at Climate Engine is that the, the science needs to be open, it needs to be transparent. It needs to be rep, 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 uh, replicable. Um, and this is kind of a problem with, with the whole climate community, at least in the business side. It's, it's everybody and their uncle kind of selling these climate risks and, and, and they're, you know, they're all kind of different. They're, they all have their different analyses, different numbers at the end of the day. Um, you know, but our view of, of the climate data is that if we are to listen to the scientists, we're always told to listen to the scientists, listen to the scientists and the scientists. Um, you know, and Andrew pointed out that there's there's a wide spectrum of potential futures, right? And a lot of that's dependent on our actions today. But regardless of those actions, if we listen to scientists, what we know for sure is that extreme weather events are going to get more frequent and more severe, right? That 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 is is there's nobody's contesting that, right? That that is just a fact. So if we take that and understand what does that actually mean, right? And how do we act on that? is we need to transform the way we manage our economies, manage our social systems, because we're gonna be hit it, getting hit by these extreme events constantly, more frequently, more severe. And, and to me, that terrifies me, right? And I, I don't think we have the, the capacity right now to, to actually make that change. Mm -hmm. So where I see a lot of value is in merging all of these systems together um, so that we can have like always on monitoring and better forecasting, right? So we can, we can forecast one week, two week, three week. When's the next massive severe drought gonna happen, right? When, when's the, the massive impact to water? Where do we have flooding? And when is that gonna happen? How does that impact assets that we care about? So, so I think, I think it's, it, you know, the work that needs to be done is, is really combining the science and the data to the socioeconomic data and merging those together so we can start taking actions now. And I think that's that's really one of the best ways that we can build resilience to the change we're seeing now. And, and quite frankly, the change we're gonna be seeing the next you know, several decades, it, it, is, it is quite frightening. Yeah, you know, Greg, this brings up a really good point. I think, thanks for that, Jamie. Like one of the really interesting intersections where we see um, you know, sort of this planetary impact uh, tied to something that socioeconomically really could impact all of us is around our food supply. And I know that your organization does a lot about uh, tracking, you know, just maritime and fishing and things like that. Would you like to maybe help us draw the connection there, Greg, with a really grounded example? Yeah, absolutely. So I think this idea of um, bridging science and policy or just the social sciences and working with sometimes, I should say, prickly stakeholders like fisheries uh, organizations is visualization is certainly a part of it, but um, 
really where we've had the most traction is with social simulation. So um, allowing these folks to participate in somewhat mock negotiations or compromise or even role play, um, because the problem is that they don't really understand um, some of the, they don't have the expertise to apply and bring this information successfully into decisions. And so our solution has actually been game-based learning. So let me explain real quickly. Um, we needed an exercise to introduce the sustainability science, climate science concepts that we've been talking about quickly and simply, but while mirroring our analytical approach. And so I've pasted in the chat, if somebody can transfer that over for me, um, some of examples, just so you can see it more visually. But there's a reason why gaming is a multi-billion dollar industry. It's because it incorporates important learning concepts into their design, uh, inspires intrinsic motivation in the players and learners. So for example, we host members of the World Bank or the UN and ask them to get in groups and gather around these large format game boards. And they're like, what? You expect me to do that? But ultimately, they, they learn about other perspectives, about reducing risk to sensitive species or different objectives for sustainable development. And you can start to see the wheels turning where often they become the most competitive among the players. And so just think about how difficult it can be to explain something like this, like what we've been talking about to a policymaker. And so in our example, through social simulation, we can convey our scientific approach to those who are not computer savvy or experienced modelers. And then we found that it allows them to explore a clear goal um, take control over the process, and it heightens their curiosity by presenting these uncertain outcomes like climate, collaboration, or even competition. And most importantly, games are fun uh, because our analytical results, although gamified, are now visualized simply and effectively. This gives the policymakers a unique experience where they can more easily interact with real scientific data. Ultimately, we talked about science catching up with policy or, or vice versa, it gives them an immediate feedback about their actions rather than having to wait for our analysis to finish. And then ultimately when our analysis is complete, everyone is more on the same page. So this idea of game-based learning has really been effective for us to kind of bridge that gap between science and policy mm -hmm. or some of these more difficult stakeholders like we see in the fisheries sector. That's pretty awesome, Greg. And I mean, Rosalie, you can hear every single one of these panelists was talking about visualization, 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 right? Really, get, I think we've always said a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think for people that are maybe new to the conversation, like you said, Greg, or trying to interpret what they're seeing in a different way, uh, visualizations are the critical element. So Rosalie, I mean, that's your whole business is to make these visualizations easier and accessible to everybody. So how did you think about that? Like, why did you, why did you go about democratizing this, this visualization platform that you built? Well, it's, um, it, it's, it's really not just about visualization. I think it's about getting data ready for ingestion and use um, by your full audience. And for many of that um, audience, it means that it needs to be visualized and easily shared, ideally with just a URL link and, and a click of a button. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's hugely important. I think one of the key things that um, that we're seeing and what's also been mentioned, um, like we can't wear um, every hat uh, every time, as, as Sina already mentioned, uh, whilst we are all like do-it-yourself type people, especially data scientists and data engineers, in reality, we need to grow the industry by choosing a focus. Um, and there are a lot of peripheral matters that everyone needs to um, have covered uh, concerning their basis, getting your data structured for internal processes and getting your outputs, uh, including visualizations, connected to the next link in the chain is a real task especially because it's not just about getting a file connected to that next next link in the chain. It's about getting that integrated and merged with other data flows, visualized in a web browser, on a mobile phone, in a custom application, like all of that needs to happen. And that gap, bridging that gap requires, requires a lot. So we all need to be smart about our focus, uh, choose to focus either on creating amazing data, creating amazing visualizations, um, and, and in our case, making sure that um, whatever data is being created by raw data producers such as Planet or by data scientists such as everyone listening in today, 
that needs to be connected to their proper audience, either via visualization on the web, via API, uh, via OGC protocols, via Python package, whichever comes closest to your direct audience's data consumption needs. I think that's that's a huge task. And, and related to sustainability, this is this is something that can't be overlooked. Like creating good data is key. Creating the best analytics is super important, but making sure it's actually usable is the last step. Um, so yeah, not to be overlooked. So Jamie, I'm gonna come back to you for just a second because I loved what you said, Rosalie, about like, let's be specific about our purpose and like what we're trying to do. And I think Jamie, you and I have been in, involved in a couple of projects where it's like, what what is the question that we could actually solve for it right now? There are a lot of problems that we're all facing, but I think being very specific about the question, like you have a, you have a PhD in natural resources, Jamie. So like your ability to really hone in on some specific questions and be able to give people insight. Um, I just wonder how could we coach organizations, governments to take a look at a panel like this and say, come to us with a specific question. We've got the data, we've got the talent, we've got the visualization, we've got the science. We, we could even gamify it to show you like how this would all work. How can we use language to get them to come to us with these questions that that hopefully we could get very specific on quickly? Yeah, no, that's great. That's a big question. A great <laughs> question. I, I mean, I, I think that the challenge is really to 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 map the questions in language they understand, right? It's it's not it's not a data science for them. It's not a data science challenge. It's not a computing challenge. It, it might not even be an environmental challenge, right? It, it's a business challenge. So, you know, if, if people are facing massive drought to their supply chain, that's where we need to meet them, right? So, okay, you're, you're fake. we can help you understand the drought, the extent of the drought, we can understand the impacts of the drought and also what the risks are to you as an organization, right? And, and I think that's, that's a big sort of falling down point um, in the sciences, to be fair, um, to, to the business community is, is that we, we as scientists have, have not traditionally done a very good job we speak to ourselves very well in journal articles and words that nobody else understands. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, we need to translate that into insights that are meaningful to them. And I think that's the, you know, that's, and, and that's the exciting part, I think, is, is really these worlds sort of coming together and understanding in the financial markets, what, what we know they're being impacted by it. They know they're being impacted by it, but how do we merge these two worlds together so we can deliver insights that are valuable to them? I think that that's, that's the big, the big question. Um, and I think honestly, it's just a matter of doing the work. I, I don't think there's any necessarily any silver bullet. I don't think it's a technology problem. I think it's just a, a problem of, of worlds kind of coming together um, and then building the underlying technology to support those insights. Absolutely. Um, but I think it just comes from communicating with each other. Well, Jamie, I love that. And Andrew, I'm going to ask you very specifically about this, because I think that the technology is there now, but I don't think it has been. I think now the combination of all of the data or the imagery that you're collecting, I think hyperscalers that are providing the infrastructure to make that data you know, available to be processed. I think uh, amazing, like Rosalie was talking about, just drives and URL links so that you can go look at it. I, you know, when I look at planet and your satellite constellations and your ability to actually take snapshots of the planet every day, I think also giving people an update if you make a change, this is what changes on the ground. And we've ca we've captured some imagery to support those changes because this is such a big problem. So, I mean, how do you feel about that? Like planet stepping up with these, these daily captures so that people can see if you make this change, this is what actually happens on the ground. Uh, it's a great question. And <clears throat> Denise, you're continuing your theme of asking huge questions, which are great. Uh, I'll, I'd like to pick up actually on something just connected to what Jamie was just saying a minute ago. So, you know, there's a wonderful, I think he was a Chilean philosopher um, named Francisco Varela, who said that when a system is unhealthy, one of the surest paths to health is to more deeply connect it with itself. And what we have today is we have these huge disparate systems and let's just pick one specifically the financial system so you know ever since adam smith was writing about capitalism you know capitalism has produced an unrivaled wealth in the world but it's really incomplete because there's a set of things about the world that that capitalism sort of assumes one of them is that nature is hyperabundant, self-replenishing, and free. 
And so therefore it's, uh, it goes unmeasured. And then because we, uh, we don't measure the value of that natural capital, this is what natu the natural capital project at Stanford and University of Minnesota and a bunch of other places actually does is try to understand what the value of that is, not the price, but the value, the value is you know, ex extraordinary. So think about like uh, the company Amazon, for example. You know, the company Amazon is measured billions of times a day down to a thousandth of a penny. The actual Amazon for which it's named is has no value at all until you cut down the trees and you sell the lumber and you convert the land into agricultural or pasture land. But of course, that ignores the, the, the value of those services that the natural capital provides. It, it, it doesn't measure the habitat value, the climate value, the value of the land to indigenous communities, and its inherent beauty and, and the fact that it is, you know, among the, the, the densest uh, reserves of life and, and biodiversity that we have on the planet. So we've got to begin to measure and, ex and not just measure what's happening, like say measuring the deforestation in the Amazon, but we've got to extract from that measurement, that continuous daily observation, a kind of indicator of risk that can be plugged into the financial system. And thankfully, right now, we're in the early stages of a huge revolution in financial markets where for the first time, nature is starting to show up on the balance sheet through a, a movement called the ESG movement or environmental, social, and governance data. That is non-financial data that informs the risk to the operations of various companies. And that measurement cannot be done without the combined talents of the people who are on the panel. You need science, data, you need the, not just the ability to visualize, but you need to be able to extract that visualization it, it, uh, and abstract it into an indicator that can be plugged into these systems at scale. And th this is really a, a great kind of, we're, we're at the beginning of a, of a kind of massive reformation of these big systems. And, and rightfully so, because we will not make it through the sustainability transition unless we do this kind of work. So, you know, it's important that we serve NGOs. It's important that we do projects. It's important that we help the scientific community understand. But at the end of the day, if we want to make this transition, we're going to have to shift the big systems that drive human civilization and like the financial markets. And it's only, I say, as I said, with this combination of talents that we do it. Well, we've just got a few minutes left, you guys, on the panel. I just wanted to remind everybody that if you're listening and you have a question for the panelists, please post it. Um, maybe easier one since Andrew says that all of mine are, are too big, but um, I think it's a really big problem. So uh, good to have you. I mean, Sina, I think like what Andrew just said, like just the example of the Amazon for me, I agree. I understand from a just, you know, like my brain understands what you're saying but it's so far away from where I am. And so, you know, do I understand on a daily basis the impacts that are happening in the Amazon? Do I understand how that translates to me as an individual moving forward? Like, how do we connect those dots? And Sina, I just wonder, again, like you were talking about bringing this all together and being able to show people how to engage um, on a personal level. I mean, what you just said, Andrew, I'm looking, I'm in the middle of the atmospheric river right now in Northern mm -hmm. California. Mm -hmm. And this has to be all connected in some way, right? And, and we just got into this atmospheric river after all of these tremendous wildfires. They're all connected. But again, Sina, like how do you actually make it, 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 make those connections for me as an individual, help bring it down even from the financial services markets to individuals and say, this is how we need to be helping, you know, hold corporations accountable, all of that type of work so that those changes happen at a bigger level. I'm just curious how you would do that, Sina. Very easy. I'm going to give you one minute. <laughs> no, well, that's the whole challenge of, you know, in one side, how you how you bring the data together. Like there, there are tons of different type of data, how you can make this data talk to each other, if you will, so that you can create that metric that you want so that that metric can be visualized and uh, delivered to the, to the user. I think it goes back to how you can bring all of this data together in, in one and being able to do uh, again, build a simple metric. It's like, here's all the metric that we have. And it, it's, it's very easy to know how much Amazon, the company Amazon is making because the metric is pretty straightforward. The numbers are uh, like pretty straightforward. But when it comes to, again, uh, uh, the, the real Amazon, it, it gets harder. And um, yeah, so I think that's 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 the key, how, how you would be able to um, 
translate things to a very simple metrics. And I, I want to emphasize on that, not complicated, a very simple metric that people can understand, people can associate with it and then then bring it to a beautiful map and then visualize it and, and, and um, kind of give it to the audience. And Greg, maybe you could jump on that a little bit and answer the question that I did see posted by Maria. She's talking about all of the data that's contributing to this and like, how do we know what it's good data? That it's data that we should be building these insights off of. Like, how do we work through that? That that the data that we're bringing in to help inform all these decisions, it's been validated. It's authoritative. It's it, it means something. Yeah, t tough one. I think um, I'm always um, agnostic to data quality when it comes in because even poor data g gives you insights into where you need to go in terms of collecting information. But ultimately, even working with very coarse data you can increase sort of the conceptual complexity of what you're trying to solve. And so that in turn will allow you to share that information as whether it's good or not so good with knowledge holders, people who understand the system and can vet it. And then that works towards improving it more. But just to add to Sina's uh, comment and link it to what Andrew brought up about, uh, I think simple metrics that are um, easy to communicate and also non-traditional ones. Uh, we've we've experimented a lot with biophysical units. I, I worked with the Stanford Natural Capital Project for many years. Um, and so non-traditional metrics like catch, biophysical units, um, how much erosion happens along the coastline. Because you can imagine if you're talking to somebody who's responsible for flood risk and management, they don't want to hear how many dollars are avoided from damages. They want to know literally how is the coastline going to change. And so coming up with new ways to measure that uh, and communicate it, I think, is really important. And uh, there are many groups, as Andrew mentioned, working on that right now. Well, you guys, I know that when we started out on this journey talking to each other about this panel today, we knew that 30 minutes wasn't going to be enough time to answer all the questions, but it's been a pleasure to be with all of you. And I appreciate your insights and hope that everybody who joined uh, took something from this. So uh, I'm not sure if somebody from Olivia or someone wants to jump in and let everybody know where to go before the next segment. Or we'll just let you all run. There you go, Alina. Hi there. So the next session, um, we'll just be starting in here. So I'm good to announce it um, whenever you guys are ready. But thank you so much for this panel and leading it, Denise. I know this was a topic a lot of our registrants were interested in hearing about. Thanks for having us, Elena. I appreciate it. And it was wonderful to see all of you guys as well.